Reporting for Heart Rhythm TV, I'm Mehek Dandi, and I'm joined today by a panel of experts who specialize in cardiology and in heart rhythm disorders. Today, we will discuss the importance of recognizing cardiac arrest in athletes, as well as ways to prevent it and protect them. First of all, I will introduce our panelists. Dr. Link is a, an attending cardiologist in electrophysiology at University of Texas Southwestern. Dr. Rachel Lampert is a cardiologist and professor of medicine at Yale University School of Medicine. Dr. Christopher Medias is joining us from Tufts University Medical Center and is the attending cardiologist in electrophysiology. And Dr. Martin Marin is joining us also from Boston and is the director of the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Center at Leahy Health. So starting off, uh, Dr. Link, uh, I want to ask you, there was a lot of speculation and discussion uh, following the January 2nd episode uh, with Damar Hamlin. How common is Commodio cordis among athletes and what are the ways to recognize it? Yeah, we see Commodio cordis about 10 to 20 times a year. <clears throat> and Commodio cordis is defined by when someone's struck in the left chest by something hard, it could be a ball, a fist, a shoulder, and then they collapse typically about five to eight seconds later. And when they're found, they're found in cardiac arrest or ventricular fibrillation. And the ventricular fibrillation they're in is the same kind of ventricular fibrillation you see with any kind of uh, underlying heart disease, such as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or coronary disease. And the treatment of it is identical to the treatment of cardiac arrest in other situations. Excellent. Um, and Dr. Medias, who needs to know about Commodio cordis? And uh, what are some of the immediate things that one could recognize uh, if that were to occur? Yeah, so the clinical spectrum uh, for Commodio cordis was actually first described by um, Marty's father, uh, Barry Marin. Um, and it was a series published in 1995 uh, of, I believe, 25 cases. Um, uh, of sudden death from chest wall impact. Uh, the majority of those were uh, involved in sport. Um, you know, as, as Dr. Link said, you know, generally these cases occur from impacts to the chest wall from a dense projectile. Um, so the most common scenarios, at least in the US, are in sports with a, um, a small dense projectile, baseball, lacrosse, hockey. You know, that being said, I think the biggest takeaway um, from the recent events are that sudden cardiac arrest can occur uh, on the playing field. Commodio cordis is one of those causes, fortunately a rare cause. Uh, and as Mark said, the management and treatment is the same as any type of cardiac arrest, quick recognition, uh, and early uh, implementation of CPR and defibrillation with AEDs. Yeah, and we are grateful that because of those interventions, uh, Damar Hamlin was discharged safely uh, after his hospitalization. Um, and uh, I'll turn to you, Dr. Marin. Uh, we hear the term athlete's heart a lot, and we obviously think about it when we think about athletes. Uh, what are the differences between that and some of the more dangerous other causes of cardiac arrest among athletes? Sure. So, you know, we, you do hear the term athlete's heart a lot. And of course, it's true that you can have an increase, small increase in wall thickness as a result of systematic training. Um, and that can sometimes overlap, for example, with mild expressions of other heart diseases that could be path pathologic. Most commonly, of course, is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And so the historical challenge has been differentiating athletes who present with mild increases in wall thickness. Do they have just athlete's heart? Is it just secondary hypertrophy from training versus are you looking at a patient that really is an athlete, but also has uh, actually mild expression of HCM that's really responsible for the increase in wall thickness? And really, I think today in, in 2023, we live in obviously, it's, a, it's, a, it's in, in a lot of ways, a great era for medicine, including um, the, the, the advancements in, in diagnostic testing, which have made a big impact here um, in helping to differentiate uh, athlete's heart from, example, HCM with, you know, advanced imaging with MRI, um, you know, ECHO is also advanced. There's a number of, of, of aspects to imaging, genetic testing. There's a lot of different strategies we can deploy, in other words, uh, with contemporary testing 
to really, really reliably today differentiate a patient reliably between a, a athlete's heart and HCM, including perhaps most importantly, uh, putting the greatest weight on, on, on two variables, wall thickness and cavity size. Anytime the wall thickness, you know, essentially achieve, is, is greater than really 13 to 14 millimeters, that really points to HCM. And if there's any ambiguity about that, using high resolution imaging with MRI can be very helpful in that situation. And cavity size is another really important one because athletes generally um, have slightly greater cavity sizes, left ventricular and diastolic dimension than patients with HCM, which usually have small to normal size with a cutoff you know, usually about 55 millimeters. And so those two variables alone can really um, very reliably differentiate um, in almost all cases between those two entities. And if not, there are a number of other ways and strategies, again, using contemporary diagnostic testing um, that can be very helpful today. And so that's sort of an overview. Gotcha. And the difference in prognosis between the two, um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy being an important cause of cardiac arrest in athletes as well, um, could you shed some light on the difference in prognosis between the two? Well, I think, you know, I think here's here's what I would say that, you know, in general, um, you know, athlete's heart is associated with, you know, benign outcome, um, you know, almost always. Um, and patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy who, who may be engaging in vigorous competitive sports, you know, may be at increased risk for life-threatening arrhythmias. Um, and um, so that's the big difference. Um, there are some challenges around uh, being able to identify um, reliably which HCM patients may be safe and which may not be. That's a big discussion and an area of controversy and challenge. Um, but I think it's fair to say without question that patients with HCM um, may be at increased risk um, mm -hmm. if they compete in vigorous competitive sports. Again, I'll just make the point that we're not talking about you know, mild to moderate recreational level activity. Um, the HCM guidelines, you know, have have over the years since the beginning um, recommended and promoted recreational activity for HCM patients as being safe and important. That's not a new concept. Um, so it's really about vigorous competitive sports where that risk may be increased for HCM patients. Thank you. Um, Dr. Lambert, I'll turn to you, given your expertise in uh, sports cardiology and uh, your leadership in education as well. Uh, what do you think is the role of educating uh, folks about out-of-hospital cardiac arrest? And following cardiac arrest, does everybody need a defibrillator? Um, so uh, as far as uh, educating uh, about cardiac arrest. I mean, I think the most important, there, there's a couple of important um, aspects here. I think um, in order to understand cardiac arrest in athletes, I think uh, we need to think about all the different causes of cardiac arrest. Cause I think, um, you know, commodio cortis as, as, as Mark has described is actually pretty rarely a cause of cardiac arrest. And when it does, uh, when that is the cause it's usually reasonably easy to make that determination. Either someone got hit in the chest or they didn't. The majority of cardiac arrest, though, occurs in people with intrinsic uh, cardiac abnormalities, which have not yet been diagnosed. Um, and those tend to fall in a couple of different categories. So uh, problems of the heart muscle, as, uh, as Marty mentioned, things like uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. There's other problems of the heart muscle, other cardiomyopathies that can also predispose to sudden death, both in athletes and in non-athletes, both during exercise and, and at other times. So um, understanding the, the overall causes, so we've got problems with your heart muscle is one uh, sort of category of, of causes. Um, another is electrical problems, um, which uh, in different series account for uh, up to probably about 40, 50% of sudden cardiac arrest in young people and in athletes. So those include uh, problems uh, commonly such as long QT, less common problems such as uh, CPVT or catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Wolf Parkinson White is another electrical problem. There are problems with the heart structure, such as uh, anomalous coronary arteries, where uh, the, the arteries uh, come off in the wrong place, compromising the blood flow. And finally, there's acquired uh, issues like uh, prior myocarditis and how common that is a cause of cardiac arrest is really uh, unclear. So I think the first uh, thing to understand is that uh, is thinking about what are the potential causes, both what we're looking for after the person is resuscitated and what we're thinking about in their family members if they're not uh, resuscitated. 
So I think that's a, a big piece of education. I think the other big part uh, uh, of education is really around the immediate response to a cardiac arrest. So this gets back to, uh, uh, we, you had mentioned earlier on, about the importance of recognizing cardiac arrest on the field, uh, immediately assuming that if someone's down, is the first question is, are they breathing? Um, you know, is their heart beating? Is it a cardiac arrest? Um, and then taking immediate action, which, um, you know, as we did see in the case of Damar Hamlin, that that assistant trainer really, uh, you know, saved his life with the immediate um, application of an AED and CPR and really immediately recognizing. And I think education around um, around a basic, uh, you know, a training in, in basic life to support BLS is really um, key. Yeah, thank you. That's a very important point. We had discussed this with, uh, during the uh, interview with Omar Carter as well. Omar Carter Foundation has done a lot of work in educating uh, uh, our general population about CPR uh, and basic life support. And one wonders if basic life support really should just be a mandatory part of our curriculum, that all our young teens and young adults should just know this and refresh uh, their, their skills every couple of years. Um, uh, I'll turn to Dr. Medias and Dr. Link. Uh, once a cardiac arrest occurs, what does it mean for the patient's family in terms of testing? And I think Dr. Marin probably um, can give us input regarding HCM-related testing. The most important thing is to find a diagnosis, look for a diagnosis in the patient uh, before you go to the family members. And that can be a problem if they don't survive, but even if they don't survive, they should have an autopsy. Genetic testing should be considered. And um, a record should be looked at to see if they have some underlying heart disease. Because if they have an underlying heart disease, then you have to look for it in the family. If they don't, then I don't think it's worth looking for in the family. If their heart is normal, um, then it's an undetermined or electrical death or commodial cortis. And I don't think you necessarily should look in the family then. Yeah, I agree. And I think, you know, what has to be um, considered very carefully, uh, you know, through shared decision making is, uh, you know, on the individual basis, uh, you know, getting back into sport and these decisions, uh, you know, can vary very widely um, among uh, patients um, and, uh, you know, their families. Um, Dr. Lampert has, has published quite a bit on this. Um, uh, that so. actually takes me back to a question, Mahak, that you had asked earlier, whether everyone with a cardiac arrest needs mm -hmm. a defibrillator. And I would say the answer is almost always yes. Commodio cortis is really the uh, potentially the only exception to that. And I would let Mark um, uh, address that further. But all if, if it's not commodio, excuse me, um, if it's not commodio, then in general, it's something intrinsic with the heart. And if it happened once, it, it's going to happen again. Uh, the other exception might be a, an anomalous coronary that you're going to fix surgically. But if you haven't either identified a reversible trigger or you haven't fixed that, and, and it's not something you can fix, like potentially an anomalous coronary, um, whether an athlete or not, um, you do need a defibrillator. Um, whether or not to return to sport after a defibrillator is, as uh, uh, Chris describes, uh, for, um, an issue for shared decision making. The data that, that we have from our uh, series of athletes that um, has been published, the ICD Sports Registry, is that we did not see adverse events in the 440 athletes, 77 of whom were, were varsity type athletes, um, when they returned to play. Now, those athletes um, were predominantly uh, participating in sports um, which are considered contact by the American Academy of Pediatrics, like soccer, basketball. We did not have a lot of um, high contact sport athletes like football or hockey and whether system damage might be different in those uh, types of athletes, we, we don't know. But we do have, uh, we do have evidence that uh, many of these athletes can go back and, and uh, participate in sports without adverse events. And Dr. Marin, for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, what does what does the a cardiac arrest imply for the rest of the family, or is testing completely independent of that? Yeah, for 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 a patient that's had a, a sudden uh, a cardiac arrest for, uh, and has a, then a diagnosis of HCM made, um, obviously for that patient, it's often very appropriate, um, as the panel was saying, you know, to consider secondary prevention therapy with the ICD. I think that's fairly clear. Um, and then, of course, there is the important, very important issues that come after diagnosis of the of the patient with respect to other family members, um, which, you know, really include 
um, systematic assessment of uh, first and close relatives um, with uh, imaging, uh, echocardiography. Uh, for kids, that's usually can be started at any point, but should be started no later than the beginning of puberty. Um, and usually extended every two, one and a half to two years through puberty, um, and then potentially less frequently beyond that till midlife. And if there's certainly any question about diagnosis with echo, moving on to MRI in that situation to clarify diagnosis of a family member is really, really important. Obviously, the diagnosis of HCM in another family member um, may be very important for a number of reasons, obviously for management, but if, but if the proban had a cardiac arrest, um, one of the risk markers and other family members um, to consider is a family history of sudden death. And so that kind of history itself uh, may have significant impact on how we manage other family members that are diagnosed with HCM, including potentially considering them as well for primary prevention, given the importance of family history, um, you know, here at increasing risk in other family members. Um, and then, of course, just to mention for, for assessment of other family members, too, there's obviously the opportunity for genetic testing uh, as another strategy as well. That's predicated uh, really first and foremost on being able to identify a pathogenic mutation uh, in the proband, which occurs about 30 to 40 percent of the time. If that's the case, then that opens up the opportunity to test other family members for that mutation to determine if they're at risk or not of developing HCM. So those are your two strategies. Understood. Um, and I think it's worth reiterating that regardless of what the cause of cardiac arrest is, the first thing to do is check if they're breathing, check if they have a pulse, and early resuscitation is the most life-saving immediate intervention that we should all know about and teach about. Um, and I really appreciate the insight of all our panelists today. I want to end with a question for each of you. Uh, given the incident on January 2nd and other cardiac arrests that you may have witnessed in your lifetime, uh, what is the key takeaway or the one message that you would want our viewers to, to take away from this? Everyone should know how to do hands-only CPR, everyone. It's a simple thing. You can learn it in 10 minutes, and everyone should know, including all the players. I think that's something we would probably all uh, agree with. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Um, again, I think the biggest takeaway is recognizing that some cardiac arrest can occur uh, on the playing field. Um, and again, the management just comes down to, um, you know, early institution of hands-on CPR and AEDs. You know, a credit to, again, the, the trainer who, who recognized this um, and started CPR quickly and effective, clearly CPR quickly. Um, you know, the science behind resuscitation uh, is amazing and cutting edge, but the actual principles, as we all know, are quite simple uh, and easy to learn and apply. Absolutely. The teamwork extends beyond the field and can be life-saving in, in these scenarios um, and could not stress this enough for, for our regular population to, to get trained in BLS and make sure that they're able to resuscitate someone in need. Um, I could not thank you all enough for uh, your insight today. We appreciate this thorough discussion now that the dust has settled. It's always nice to visit back uh, on what happened and what the key takeaways are and, and reflect. Um, and. Uh, uh, I thank you all, and uh, we'll see you later. Thank you. See you later. Thank you.